Hello everyone, welcome back to the Gates of Hulda. I have a great session for you today. I'm going to be discussing 2 Chronicles 7.14 where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So the question is, who are the people called by his name? Is he talking to all Christians? Or is it a specific group of people? I want to answer that question today. And I also want to tell you what that name is. The people called by my name. Well, what is his name? Now, if you haven't listened to the previous messages on the true identity of the Negro, I encourage you to go back and listen to those lessons because they will set the foundation for the information that I'm going to share with you today. There's a link in the top right corner. You can click on that and it will take you back to that series. So let's get started on today's session. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. This is a very popular scripture. Many pastors often preach this verse and they say that Christians need to repent of sin and turn back to the Lord so that he will bless his church and of course America. But are these words directed to Christians and specifically American Christians? These words were spoken to Solomon king of Israel. So likewise, the land referred to was the land of Israel. Can Christians around the world benefit from this scripture? Of course. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. But we have to rightly divide the scriptures. When you read, ask, who is talking? Who is he talking to? What is the context of the message? And sometimes you may need to read the preceding verses or even chapters to fully understand this. And then finally pray and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal how the words apply to you. So is America Israel? No. Of course, the precepts, laws, and some of the promises can be applied to Christians today. However, there were certain promises that only apply to the children of Israel as a result of their function or their role in the earth. So the, the replacement theology that says Christians replace the children of Israel is in complete error. The church has not replaced Israel. How do we know that this, this doctrine is false? Well, there are several, several things that we can look at. The Bible says that the promises of the covenant made to Israel are eternal, meaning they're unbreakable. And then there are prophecies that talk about the future permanent restoration of the nation of Israel. You need to do some studying on the day of the Lord because this is when the kinsman redeemer, the Messiah, comes back to judge the nations concerning the treatment of his people and the dividing of his land. And then the New Testament talks about the restoration of Israel. Why would they need to be restored if everybody is now the true Israel? And nowhere in the entire New Testament is the term Israel used for those who are not ethnic children of Israel. So therefore, no Bible basis exists for identifying the church as the new Israel. And I wonder if this theology really isn't rooted in pride. That's food for thought there. Lastly, if the Most High breaks his covenant with Israel, then how can we trust him to keep his promises to anyone else? We know this is not possible 
because it is impossible for him to lie. So this replacement theology, it's a myth. It is not true. This verse of scripture, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, this was specifically talking about Israel. But now we need to examine when he says, those who are called by my name, well, what is his name? And the next question is, if the people don't know that they are the ones called by his name, how can they fulfill the requirements that's being asked of them? They are, to they are told to do some specific things. They need to humble themselves. They need to pray, seek his face, turn from their wicked ways. Then he will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. Again, it's talking about the land of Israel. So we need to know what is the name that they are called by. Let's take a look at that. Many of you may remember the song Kumbaya, but what you didn't know is that the slaves were actually praying as they were singing that song. They were using the name, the true name of the Heavenly Father, Yah. When they were saying Kumbaya, they were saying, come by here, my Lord. And the name was Yah. And this is referenced in Psalm 68 and 4, where it says, sing to God, sing praises to his name, extol him who rise on the clouds by his name, Yah. Yahweh and rejoice before him. Now, this song survived through the centuries and we're now learning as we're uncovering this information that they were using the true name of the Heavenly Father. This is why they were not allowed to speak in their native language. They were separated, you know, constantly sold off to different plantation owners because they were trying to prevent them from passing on the history. And this is how we forgot our heritage. It's how we forgot our native language. But this song, this was a breadcrumb to let us know the true name of our Heavenly Father. And we're finding that the name Yah, it was in the names of a lot of the slaves. They're finding their names as they're going through the old records from the slave ships. And I'll show that to you in a minute. But it's not a coincidence that they knew his name and they used the name Yah as they were singing the song. Another word that we're familiar with is hallelujah. And the yah, J-A-H, this is an English interjection. It's a transliteration of the Hebrew word hallelujah. But the word yah, it appears by itself as a divine name 49 times in the Hebrew. And it also appeared at the end of Israelite names, for example, Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah, it was actually pronounced Jeremiah with Y and not the H. They didn't have J. And his name meant Yahweh is exalted. So again, we see the name of the ancient of days in the highest praise. Hallelujah. In Wars of the Jews, Book 5, Chapter 5, Section 7, that the Tetragrammaton was pronounced by the priests prior to the temple's destruction, and they pronounced it as four vowels. We believe that the demands of the language declare those vowels to be E, A, U, A, which we have captured in the construction of the word Yawa, Yawa. The construct of the first two letters is one that is common in modern Hebrew, where the yod is pronounced e, with the vowel he being pronounced a. 
creating ya, which we have captured as ya. The construct of these four letters is one that is common in modern Hebrew, where the he is pronounced with the vowel a, creating a or ya. This name stands alone as ya 45 times. I wanted to share this information with you, and you can find this by going to slavevoyages.org and just take a look at their database for the slave voyages and just type in yah y-a-h you will get lists of names with yah in the name look at that that's not a coincidence right here and yah look at that yar yah this one is young as 11 years old. And then look over here, the origin. Ebo, Hebo, Hebrew. The evidence is, is clear, you all. And I know that there are some who will look at this information and see it and still deny that this is true, that we are the people called by his name. This is why they force them to change their names to European names. This is the reason. I'm going to show you another one. Let's take a look at this next one. This is another page showing the names of the slaves. And you can clearly see that they have Yah in their names. The people called by my name. Look at this little one right here, two years old. But look at what they named her, Yaba. This is clear evidence here that these are the people who were called by his name. And this is why they were forced to change their name. I encourage you to pull up this database. You'll be surprised by what you find. I wanted to share some information with you regarding the Hebrew language, and it, it comes from this article, Is Ancient Hebrew a Dead Language? And this is by Jeff Benner. But I wanted to point out some things in this article because you're going to hear as you're learning this information, different presenters <coughs> use various pronunciations for um, the Hebrew words for God or Jesus. And I can remember when I first started learning about this, I heard so many different ways to pronounce the names, particularly Jesus. I heard Yahweh Shai, Yahweh Yeshua, no, it's Yahshua. And it can start to be confusing. And I can remember for me, I there was a time when I stopped wanting to pray because I was scared that I would use the wrong name. And whenever confusion is in, present, you know that Satan has a hand in it. So please don't allow yourself to be intimidated because of the different variations that you will hear as people are using the Hebrew uh, words. And in particular, in this article, it talks about how the Hebrew, it was Paleo-Hebrew, and it's a script much different from current texts. They use dots. Dots were used as word separators, and there were no distinctions between medial and final forms. So you're talking about a language that was written without vowels. And for those of us who are English speakers, we're having to learn a word without using a vowel. And that could be, it can be very difficult. But they're now admitting, as to some readily acknowledge that these vowel pointing systems were neither original nor historically accurate. So you have to think about what it's like learning a new language it happens in stages and it happens over time and children if you think about a child learning a language they learn it through interactions you learn it through word associations 
And it doesn't just happen overnight. Often mental pictures are created in your mind first. So just understand that. I want you to be able to understand that as you're hearing um, the different pronunciations. But I believe a lot of us can come together and agree on the ancient name of the father as Yah. Now, when you come to the other names like Yahweh or the name for Jesus, Yeshua or Yeshua, Yeshaya, <laughs> you're going to hear some different variations there. But I can remember for me, I came to the revelation of just think about a group of women being in a room, all mothers, let's say a hundred women in the room and they're all mothers. If my children were to walk into the room, they call me mom. I would recognize the voice of my children if they were to call me because I know who I am and I recognize their voice as a result of the relationship I've had with them over these years. So uh, there could be 50 other women in there and their children also call them mom. When my children say it, those women would know they're not talking to me. Because I, I don't know them. I don't recognize that voice. So when we're praying to the Father, He knows the voice of His children. He knows when you are crying out to Him. And just think about that word association and the image when, when I'm praying and I'm thinking about my Father and I'm thinking about the one who died for me. At, picturing him as Abba, the relationship over the years, prayers that he's answered as a result of me calling his name. All of those things come back, you know, to my memory. So I'm associating his attributes, his characteristics. All of those things are important as I'm calling his name. So as you begin to learn, it's going to take time for you to develop that relationship using the Hebrew form of that word. But what I'd love to see happen is for the Hebrews who are learning this and learning Paleo Hebrew, if they could just come together and discuss those points that they disagree on, you know, behind closed doors. And then, you know, in public, we come together and rally around those things that we do agree on. Because Satan wants nothing more than to have people walking in strife and division. And the beauty of all of this is that we're finally learning about who we are. That is the beauty of it all. We're finally learning our true history. We're learning about who our true father is. So yeah, please remember that example of the father knowing who he is, just like a, a mom, a father. They would recognize the voice of their children when they're speaking to them. We don't want to walk around in confusion or strife and give place to the enemy. Here's the good news right here. The pure language will be restored. Here we see in Zephaniah 3, 8 through 9, it says, therefore, wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up for plunder. My determination is to gather the nations to my assembly of kingdoms to pour on them my indignation. This is talking about the day of the Lord. When he comes back, he says he's going to judge the nations concerning the treatment of his people and how the nations parted his land. It goes on to say, All the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language, that they may all call on the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. We see that the pure language is going to be restored to us. So then, you know, all of the confusion about which name is it how do we pronounce it it is going to come he knew what was going to happen he knew that the enemy was going to try to corrupt the name 
uh, so that people wouldn't be able to recognize uh, the name, his name. But again, think about the relationship. Think about his attributes and his character because the language will be restored. I am looking forward to that day. So what in the world happened to us that we have forgotten our heritage, we've forgotten our language? What happened? And if you go back and listen to Negro Find Out Who You Really Are, the series that I mentioned, that will really help you to understand about the curses, how the people had to fulfill all of those curses that came upon them as a result of their sin, the paganism and idolatry. All of those things had to be fulfilled. And if you remember the prophecy that was given to Abraham, it said his descendants would be in a nation, enslaved in a nation that was not theirs, and they would be mistreated in this land for 400 years. But it says that they, the judgment would come first to the nation that enslaved them, and then they would be removed from that land. So Paul is talking here about the condition of the children of Israel being temporary. Yes, we have forgotten a lot of things, and it was because we were, it was like we were given us a spirit of slumber where we've been asleep. The great news is the awakening has begun and we are beginning to remember who we are. So let's take a look at the scripture. It says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people whom he, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? how he pleads with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does this divine, what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Even so, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no longer of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace, but it is of works. It is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded just as it is written. God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. So that is what is happening with the people now, this awakening, where at the times of the Gentiles are being fulfilled and the people are now waking up. That's how we know that this is an end time prophecy and we see us coming into the truth about who we are as a people and this month August 2019 represents 400 years since our people were brought to this nation it serves as a marker in time it's a marker to let us know that we are the people he's talking about however as a reminder, the prophecy to Abraham said that the judgment of the nation that enslaved them would come first before the people are delivered out of the land. We also know that there was a prophecy given that there would be people who would try to pretend to be the true people. They declare themselves to be the true people of the book. And that also had to be fulfilled. So we're also living in that time. This is the scripture reference here that I'm referring to. Revelation 3 and 9, it says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. 
Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So again, there was a prophecy that there would be people who say they are the true Jews. And they didn't call themselves Jews. Yehuda or Judah, there would be those who are saying that they are the true people from the tribe of Judah, but it says they are not. It says they are lying. <laughs> and he says, I'm going to make them come and worship before your feet and know that I have loved you. So how do you explain the scripture? For those who are students of the Bible, what is your explanation for what this scripture is saying? Particularly, he, he tells you where they go to worship. He says they it's the synagogue of Satan. Who else can you say this would pertain to? You know, I would really love to know the answer to that question for those who are disagreeing with us. How else do you explain Revelation 3 and 9? It's talking about a specific group of people who would say they are the true people, but they are not. They lie. I'm not saying this. The scripture is saying this. So we need to believe what the scripture is saying. Yes, the Negroes, the Blacks, the so-called African Americans, we are the ones called by his name. The slave records show that they had the name Yah in their names when they were brought to this land. This is the reason they could not use their name. They were not allowed to learn to read because this was the plot of the enemy to strip their identities, to remove their heritage. But in these last days, knowledge is increasing and the truth is being uncovered. The DNA is now proving it. The books that are being found, the old books that had the truth about who we are, they're being revealed and uncovered, and I've shared some of them with you in previous videos. And there's other information out there for those who really want to know the truth. But we are the people who are called by his name. When we learn who we are and humble ourselves and pray, we need to seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven. He will forgive us of our sin and heal our land. Brothers and sisters, this is the truth. For those who want to hear it or not, truth is truth. Whether or not it makes you uncomfortable, it's still the truth. So hopefully you will like this video, share it, subscribe to our channel, and join me next time at the Gates of Halta, where we take a deeper look at history and the Bible to uncover some of the half-truths that has opened the door to deception. Shalom, everyone.